Hallelujah. Welcome to church tonight, everybody. We're glad that you're here. Amen. Are you glad to be at church tonight? Be in God's presence. Get filled with his word. Amen. Are you a new creation in Christ? We're going to sing that tonight. Amen. And worship our Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Lord, in your house tonight. Jesus, Jesus. 
Praise God. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Well, praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We're blessed to have you here. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want to thank Brother Joel for, for uh, ministering the last couple Wednesday nights on tithes. We're going to follow right along that idea tonight, talking about overcoming small harvests. And we're going to look particularly at our giving in relation to our offerings and the things that we can do to see increase in our giving. Amen. Uh, I'm not talking about increase in your dollars and cents in the sense of the church gets it. I mean that you get a harvest, that you get increase, all right? I'm not trying to get in your pocket by any means, but I am certainly working on getting the Lord in it, Amen. getting his word and his spirit, his power, his anointing manifesting in your giving. Amen. So we're going to talk about that tonight, and um, we'll let God do what he wants to do, and then we'll uh, give our offerings. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you. 
Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come and to grow in the knowledge and understanding of your word. We, res- we, we, we yield our hearts, Father, and receive the fullness of your wisdom. We thank you, Father God, for the power of your word working in all of our giving and our sowing, Father, increasing us on every wave as your word is commanded, Father. We hold fast to that which we confess, and we thank you, Father, for the manifestation of your blessing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as I said, we're going to talk about overcoming small harvest tonight. You know, I think all of us can acknowledge the fact that if you've been in church and you know anything about the principles of sowing and reaping, all of you who have learned those things and have operated in those things and have sown and given not just your tithes but your offerings, All of us have experienced seasons in our life where sometimes we ask ourselves, why is my harvest so small? I'm I'm believing God for X and I ended up with Y. Or for, for some people, they don't even know what their harvest is. They got blessed, but they don't even connect it to their giving. So many times we are... Uh, so uninvested in what we're doing when it comes to giving. You know, we we do it out of respect and honor for God, but we should keep track of what it is we're believing God for. Farmer don't plant his seed and then forget about it. I mean, it don't just get out of the field by itself. The giving part, the sowing part, that's just the beginning. If we're going to fully see the manifestation of that seed in, in, in our belly... And in the belly that God wants us to sow it into, we got to have it to do. We can't just throw it in the ground and then forget it's there. While, yes, I do believe and understand the importance of a seed being sown and it dying. By it dying means I don't keep digging it up and looking at it. Once I've given it, I give it. But I should be manifesting my faith and my eye and my heart on what it is that the harvest will be. What am I believing God for? And many reasons why people see small things is because they had such small expectation. They gave, got busy, gave, got busy, gave, got busy, and before long, they don't know what they're believing God for. Outside of their needs, they're not really expecting anything more than that. And that is why we have such small harvest. There are so many people that reap small harvests. And the Bible gives us some great insight. If we'll follow it, it'll increase that harvest. It'll increase the seed working at a better level. Because I don't really need to spend tonight. Joel has done an excellent job in teaching on why we should tithe. None of us, if we've learned anything in the last couple weeks, should be even doubting the need to be a giver. What I want to look at tonight is the other side of one you've sown. What are the things we can be doing from the time it's planted to the time it's produced? And when it is produced, we understand and know what it is that is producing. Amen? So I want to give you six insights tonight that will help you, I believe, to increase your harvest. Before I start, I want to lay a little foundation of why I'm teaching this. You know, there's a lot of this, there's a lot of notions in our world that we should not give to get. There's a lot of criticism about the, <clears throat> the, the word of faith people. That we're just preachers are just trying to get in your pocket. And that we should not take the attitude of give to get. Well, I would argue with that only because the Bible doesn't say that. Religion says a lot of things that the Bible doesn't say. I don't know if you realize that or not. But 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. If you give little, you're going to get little. I mean, he's saying right there, you're going to get what you give. How can we say we don't give to get when the Bible is clearly telling you if you don't give a lot, you don't reap a lot. If you don't give, you don't get. I mean, I'm not making it up. It says it there. It says it in lots of places. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. The Greek word sparingly here is stingy. The dictionary defines stingy as giving or spending reluctantly, scantily, meagerly. Does that sound anything like you're giving? I don't know, but if it does, then you're just what? Sparingly in your giving. It's not a criticism. It's just an understanding of what we're doing to ourselves. Come on. No farmer can be mad that only five acres produced a harvest when he only sowed five acres. 
Well, I thought God was supernaturally abundantly above all I asked or think. Yeah, but you gave him a meager amount. You were stingy in your giving, and now you're shocked that it came back stingy. And I, again, it's not a criticism. Please hear what I'm saying. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just trying to show you tonight and those watching online what God says about giving and what the God says about our harvest. What you do with it is still up to you. Don't ever give. These same verses go on to say don't give grudgingly and don't give of necessity. God wants us to give cheerfully. But sometimes to be able to get cheerful we have to go through the realization of where we are. Cheerful does not mean naive. Just be happy without knowing why. I'm cheerful because I know. I understand what I'm happy or cheerful about. Are you following me? So please don't feel like as I preach this and it comes across as Pastor Dan often comes across that I'm trying to get anything out of you because I'm not. I am trying to expand our understanding of seed. And understand at a greater level what is potentially available if I'll do the work. Okay, so it's, it's take it or leave it. Eat the hay, spit out the sticks, all right? So if you're not a giver, it might feel worse than if you are a giver. That's just the truth. And, and that's clearly laid out here. You're going to get little when you give little. You're going to get a lot when you give a lot. All right, and that's uh, oaky definitions of uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Hallelujah. When you're reluctant to give, what we find is, your harvest is reluctant to give. When the seed doesn't have a lot of expectation, it doesn't give a lot. You know, I watch guys on uh, YouTube sometimes, these farmers and you know, dairy farmers and all these different guys, and they talk about all the science behind what they do, you know. And a lot of it, to get good milk, they got to plant good seed in the ground because what they're feeding the cow has everything to do with what comes out of the cow. And so they talk a lot about this certain kind of seed and why we use this seed and it has more of this and more of that and the cow digests it better. And there's a whole science to it and I'm thinking, why can't I have that kind of understanding about my own seed? I should know the science behind how the seed I'm sowing works. And that's what I'm trying to do here tonight, okay? In, in, in the one hour that I have to do it, hallelujah. Uh, Luke 6, 38, for with the same measure that you use, It'll be measured back to you. Again, how you give determines how you get. So get out of your head, I don't give to get. That's not selfish. It is just simply what God's word says. The measure spoken of here in Luke 6 can be interpreted as referring to the size or the measure or the way that we measure. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So again, the size of harvest begins with the measuring of the sower. It does not begin with God. It begins with you. How you measure seed determines how that seed produces. So when you give your $5 and you have no measurement of what that is doing, then don't be shocked when that measurement is used to produce your harvest. And of course, that's why we don't know it's a harvest. Because it was sown with such small measurements. Didn't really mean anything. It was just time to give and the bucket was coming. And I didn't want to be the only one in the row who didn't give. That's how we measured it. And we're all guilty of it, by the way. Every one of us. Every one of us have not given because we're broke. Every one of us has let the pressure of poverty measure the amount of giving we give. And then we don't understand why it doesn't work for us. If we're grudging, we'll get it grudgingly. If we give cheerfully, we'll get it cheerfully. It produces what it is sown. So I want to remind you before I get into my points, get out of this religious mindset that giving is just simply about honoring God. Of course it is, and of course it should be, and it should always, but it doesn't start and stop with honoring God. It also starts with how I want the seed to produce, and what I want the seed to produce. What am I asking God to do with this? What am I believing God for? 
you know, a lot of us won't be in a lot of faith for something we don't have a lot of value in. When God says 10 grand, you're in faith. $10, not a lot of faith. So it's relevant to how much the seed costs you. So if we're going to see our harvest increase, number one, we have to decide to sow as much as we can. If we start with small measurements, we're going to get small measurements in return. And again, before you go right to your religious, he's getting in my pocket. I have said I am not. Okay? Boy, we love to hold on to some things. And we won't receive. And so I'm, I keep challenging you that. Let God bless you tonight. Don't get stingy. Because I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you to hear what God is saying. Amen? Amen. There is, there, this is such a basic principle to giving. It seems obvious, but a lot of people overlook it. They'll put a dollar or two in the offering. And we are talking about offering, not tithe. You can't tithe more than 10%. You can't give more than 10% and it be tithe. Anything over 10% is what we're talking about. The other 90 is where we're sowing from. Tithe is not sowing. Tithe belongs to the Lord. Offerings are sowing. Tithe are God's. And God has promised certain things in response to that tithe. So I'm not talking about tithing. Joel, again, talked about that. I'm talking about the other 90 that you give from, okay? I'm not talking about where it goes or who you're giving it to. I'm simply talking about what is yours and how much of that you give. When people don't receive as much of a return as they expect, they often think God must want them to have a small harvest. God must not wanted me to do that. Or I must have got into sin and God hindered it from happening. Or I've done. We always turn to judgment. Do you realize that? But reality is, most of the time, we didn't really have any high expectation in it anyways. Or we started high and then forgot about it three days later. We didn't give it time to germinate. And grow and produce. And so we just write it off to, well, maybe I didn't have faith or I didn't understand something. You know, we all come up with some good excuses, don't we? <clears throat> when we fail to realize what really is happening is God didn't determine the size of the harvest. We determined it when we gave. So whatever the excuse is about the amount of harvest, it really begins with the amount of seed. How did you give? How much did you give? What were you expecting when you gave? Those are all obvious things determining what the seed is. And when we don't put that effort in because we get in a hurry, I'm telling you, we get in a hurry when it's offering time. Hurry up and get it out of the way. It's like the announcement sometimes. No, it's part of worship. This is why I have such a hard time doing it at the end all the time. Dad loved the offering at the end. Because he wanted to get right up in behind worship. But I always felt like offering time was part of worship. And I don't know if we really do it the justice it needs in my own heart. And we will figure that out to where I'm happy with it. But until that happens, don't get in a hurry. A hurry doesn't need to be 40 minutes. You don't need to take a long time when you came prepared to give. The reason why offerings go 40 minutes is the preacher doesn't think you were ready to give. So I need to teach you into giving. And while I think I should teach you, you should already be ready to give. You should already know what this is about and why I'm doing it. And see, this is what I'm saying. I'm not saying just throw money at the problem. I'm saying give as much as you can because the more harvest you have, the, the more seed you have, the more harvest you'll have. It's not about what the church needs or the preacher wants. It's about you. It's about harvest. It's about in the ground. If you don't sow much, you won't have much harvest. you got to plant it for it to increase. And when that increase comes, what we should do is plant it again. You'd be amazed how fast seed grows when you keep putting it in the ground. We put it in once. We put it in twice. Then we put it in once. And then we put it in twice. So we get four harvests. 
Are you following me? Continually give as much as you can. It doesn't always have to be in one place. I'm not trying to get all your money. Ask God. We're going to look at that. Ask the Holy Spirit. Where should I be giving? You know, anytime I'm listening to, to the radio or I'm listening to a minister and I get some revelation out of them, I send them an offering. Why? Because I got something I'm going to use and they ought to be blessed for that. So I'm constantly mindful of where I can sow. I'll be honest, most people are only mindful of what they need to pay their bills. And they're not really mindful of sowing. Where can I give? How can I be a blessing? Where can I sow? We miss the opportunities because we're only looking to get what our needs are met. Instead of using it as ground to continually sow. When you know I'm going to have a guest speaker in, you should already know they're going to need something. Over and above my tithe, I better go ahead and be planning on doing something. Ask the Lord, what should I give this person? Uh, uh, Father, I'm going to keep my heart open and what I get out of their message is going to be shown in my giving. You see, I do that. I don't need to motivate you to do that. I should want to do that because I want to give into good ground. 2 Corinthians 9.10 now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Essentially, this verse is saying that God gives seed to sowers and bread to eaters. What does that mean? This is talking about how God always gives extra to people who are givers, but only supplies basic needs of eaters. Eaters are those who are using their finances primarily for their needs. If all you are consumed about are your own needs, then your giving will produce the harvest for that much. But the problem is you're eating your seed to take care of your needs. Not going to hell over it, just take ownership of it. Sowers are those who use their finances primarily to give to others. Again, it's a mental issue and a heart issue is my mind focused on being a giver and is my heart open to doing it when I see it when an opportunity comes I'm not saying don't pay your rent and pay someone else's rent that's not what God is saying God is saying have a heart of a sower have a mind of a sower see opportunity and don't let money dictate what you do if it's five dollars it's I gave I gave I gave I gave that's the attitude that gets a bigger harvest. We continue to put seed in the ground. Now, listen, I'll say this. Not every seed is a dollar. Some seed is your time. Some seed are your prayers. Some seed is your effort. But you're the one who decides what it is and how you give it. If you're going to give your time, give it generously. In other words, good. Don't show up to Ministry of Helps and haven't read the curriculum. Don't know how to teach the kids. Don't remember anybody's name that you open the door for every Sunday. Like, put some effort into it. If you're going to give your time, give quality time. If you're going to give money, give the quality of it. Give, give in a generous way. Are you following me? Yes. See, what this comes down to is the attitude of the heart. And while I don't deny that sowers have to eat too, the money that's coming into their lives is flowing through them. And as it flows through you, there's always plenty enough to take care of you. But your giving is not focused on the needs you have, but on the needs of others. That's what God sees. Oh, this person's a sower. They're going to get a generous portion because they'll keep giving. If I give it to this guy, he'll eat it. And while it won't go to hell... The harvest can't survive when you eat it. There is no harvest. There's only digestion. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Boy, there's a sermon right there I won't go into. Hallelujah. Think of it like this. Eaters are like babies. Be eaters take. Eaters don't give a lot back. I think that answers a lot of questions of why people don't see enough return on their giving. It started small. It started small in their thinking. And again, please don't hear dollars and cents. Don't hear zeros on your check. 
I'm not talking about the amount of the size. I'm talking about the size in portion to what you have. So if you have $2 and you give a dollar, you just gave 50%. That's a lot. The widow's mite was more because it was all that she had, not all that everybody had. So I don't care what your dollar amount is. You should care in relation to what you have. And that's why we don't look and judge and compare to what others do. If the bucket goes by and they didn't put anything in it, what is that to you? Maybe they gave online. Maybe they want to give it privately. Maybe they're going to give it on Sunday. You get what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what the other person does. It matters what I'm doing. Am I eating it or am I sowing it? Because what, the way I give is determining how I get just two verses prior to what we just read, Paul said, God is able to make all grace abound to you. That you having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Notice the reason God made grace abound is because you give into every good work. Why would grace abound into someone who will just eat it? See, the key into giving often is because you want grace to abound. You want the fruit of righteousness. You want to increase as part of the flow of your life. Not just out of debt. Not just bills paid this week. Who doesn't want that? All that can happen as it flows through you. Or I can just say that's enough. And then that's all I'll ever get. And that's why many never get past just getting by. Because they have never determined in their heart to be anything more than a person who just gets by. Thank you for the two amens. Listen, prosperity is not for us. It's to bless others. I know that's a radical thought, but God wants you blessed to be a blessing. And that's where many of us miss it. Remember this, before we can be a blessing, we have to be blessed. And the blessing we need to use has to be determined by the way we choose to be as givers. Not as we get the harvest. I'm going to give and I'm going to give and I'm going to give and I'm going to determine to be a person who gives and takes notice of that in myself. And I'm going to believe that as I do, it causes an abundance of harvest to produce more. And the more I get, the more I'm able to give. And the more I'm able to give, the more blessed I am. And that's the process of seed time and harvest. So if I want more, I need to give more. Are you hearing me? Number two. I got to speed up here. I'm going too slow. Sow into good ground. Sow as much as you can. Number two, sow into good ground. A lot of the reasons we have small harvests is we're giving it all to the homeless guy or the drug addict or the, the child who, you know, won't live right. And you rationalize, God will understand, so I'm going to give them my tithes. That ground ain't any good for that seed. First of all, the tithe don't belong to anybody but God. So giving it to your kid because they lost their job doesn't count. That should come out of my 90. Matthew chapter 7 verse 16 says that you shall know them by their fruits. The quality of your harvest is directly affected by the quality of the ground where you have sown. We've all sown out of emotion. We've all sown in those moments where we were just moved to tears and thought, I got to be a part of this. And there's not, again, nothing wrong with that. We've all, we've all been there. But the harvest I need from that is affected by the quality of the ministry, the person, the environment in which I sow. So while I am looking continually for places to give, I do understand the quality of the place I'm giving. So when I gave the homeless man a tank of gas at Quick Trip, I know he was lying to me, but I did it anyways. But I'm not expecting God to pay my house off from that. You hearing me? God says when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. So I lent to the Lord. You study that out, it's 20%. So when I bought his gas, I can expect at least 20% off of that if, because he's poor. At least I see him as poor. I don't know if he's a liar or not. I just, 
being generous. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a little naive and assume that he probably is poor. Because I never met anybody with means to ask me for gas, ever. Anybody, I, they would be embarrassed to ask me. So if the fact that the man is humbling himself enough to ask, whether he's a liar or not, is between him and God. But I'm not going to do it and then ask God to do some miraculous thing out of that. The ground isn't as good as it is sowing into a ministry that sees a million people born again. That's going to be better ground. So the key is, what is the ground? So what do you get out of this church? What is the spiritual food? What is the purpose? Discipleship, maturing, growing, right? Are you getting that? If you're getting that, then it's good ground for you, and you should be sowing into it. If you want evangelism, sow into an evangelist. But I'm here to disciple, to grow, to train, to admonish. I'm a pastor. I'm a shepherd. This ministry is important. God says to give into the storehouse. This is the place you get the majority of your feeding. Then you should give to it, and you should understand the value of it. Not just give because you like the light or the carpet, or the chair, or whatever. No, you give because you're, you're the food of the Spirit. The life of God, the wisdom of God, the instruction of God, there's value to that. This is why we sow 20 to 25% of our income every year into ministries, outreaches. Why? Because I want to connect to ministries that are doing things I'm not doing. I want seed in the grounds of these places so I can reap harvest from their work. You should be reaping harvest from the work that you're sitting under. The word I'm sowing into your life should produce. If it don't produce, the first place to look is not always me, but my own. Am I using any of this? Am I doing anything with this? Are you following me? So we need to determine, is the ground good? But we also need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not lead you to waste your seed by planting it in ground that's not strong or not nourishable, that won't produce. Follow that leading. When you get a check in that moment, don't do it. Don't disobey that. It doesn't matter. Listen, it's a great training ground. It's great moments because I'm telling you, People in our modern world are really good at selling a story. I mean, man, they, they got it down. I mean, they know when to tear. They, they like have the skill of turning on tears, and they bring their kids into it. And if they know you, they know what you're soft about, and they'll bring that into the story, their dog or their cat or something, because you like cats. And so I have three cats, and one's leg got broken. I don't have enough to pay for it. And they know it'll touch on you. And you really got to be sensitive, because we'll fall into those things like that. And before long, we're thinking, oh, that felt so good. And then you see them at the casino. And you're like, how are you? What happened? And then you're so mad at yourself, the next five people God wanted you to bless, you didn't. So we have to be sensitive. It's possible to waste seed by sowing money. How? Because we sow it into people based on works or emotions and not faith and not spirit-led. Don't waste anything on haphazardly decisions off the top of your head. Stay open to the Spirit of God. Follow the inward witness. We've spent Hours teaching on the Holy Spirit and the inward witness. Know his leading. Understand and know what's good ground and isn't good ground. There are things in my life through experience that has shaped how I give into certain ministries. And I have very clear parameters on what I will and won't give into. And when there is ever a time that I have an opportunity to give into something I normally would not, rather than just say no, I pray about it. And I ask the Holy Ghost, now you know this is not how I normally do, but if you want me to, I will. And so I don't want to keep the Holy Ghost by my rules, but I also want to have rules to keep me from giving emotionally. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a problem. You're either not a giver or don't give very much, so it doesn't matter. Five dollars don't need a lot of parameters. Ten thousand, twenty thousand, that's a lot of money. You better know what you're sowing. Are you hearing me? 
A thousand dollars. I don't know what's a lot to you, but whatever that a lot is, it should have some, some responsibility behind it from you. Number three, tithing creates a climate of blessing. So as I'm sowing more and I'm looking at the things in which I'm giving, I'm also recognizing that while I'm over here tithing, this tithe is creating the environment for this offering. What I'm doing as a tither is creating a climate of blessing for all the other seed I give. First of all, you can't truly be a giver when you're a robber. So I don't know how the math works if you give but don't tithe. Because you're stealing from the Lord. So if you're not a tither and you just give, how about we just stop the giving and work on the tithe? Don't give all your money to the building fund, but never give a dime to the tithe. Are you hearing me? Don't do that. That's not helping you or us. Because I don't want all that contaminated seed. I got a whole sermon on that. We don't want that corruptible seed. We want incorruptible. The kind that just keeps on working because it's faith seed. Are you hearing me? Malachi 3, 3, 11 we all know Malachi 3. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. While tithing does not qualify as sowing because it belongs to God, it does open the windows of heaven. It does create the climate for which all seed flourishes. And when it's flourishing, he's telling us here, the environment of giving creates a rebuking of the devourer for your sake. Tithing creates an environment where fruit is not destroyed. So there is an environment in which seed works in that comes from tithing, not giving. So when the windows of heaven are open in my life, when the devourer is rebuked, when my fruit is not destroyed, that's an environment in my life as I sow that I know I got fair weather. I'm not sowing in droughts. Remember, Abraham's son did that. He did that by the leading of the Spirit, and it was supernatural in its return. Nobody gets a hundredfold in a drought unless it's God. So we give led by the Holy Spirit, but our tithe creates the environment and climate for which that seed will work. Are you following me? When the ground's right, the climate for the seed is right, it will produce. So remember, tithing is a big factor in a harvest producing. My tithe over here has everything to do with the environment in which God is working for the rest of that seed to produce a bigger harvest. Don't ever take your tithe to meet a pledge. Don't rob your tithe because you want to get the building pledge paid off. Don't take your tithe and give it to the missionary. The tithe belongs to the storehouse. Too many people do that. They tithe emotionally. You need to tithe in the place you are being fed. Are you hearing me? I'm not trying to rob you from giving. If this place ain't working, go find somewhere else. Your tithe belongs to the place that you're getting the fed the most. When you want buried and married and you want uh, visited in a hospital and you want help with your rent, you need help with your marriage, uh, it's not the TV guy that's going to do any of that. Guess who it is? Pastor Dan, Pastor John, and we are more than happy to do it. More than that, we are required by God to do it. And I'm happy, but I don't much like doing it for strangers. I'm not called to marry everybody, bury everybody, counsel everybody. I I shepherd my sheep. And by the way, you need to decide if you are a sheep, because there's all kinds of sheep and goats and wolves And there's wolves in sheep clothing. They're all in the same place. And I'm all up here preaching to them, but they're not all sheep. Sometimes we don't know the difference. I pray regularly that God reveals that to me. Not so I go around hitting people, but I know and I understand. I'm not looking for a fight, but I'm not going to be deceived. What I'm going to do is determined by me and my own heart and my responsibility. 
That's why I often say, I know I'm getting off here, but it's why I often say, look, if the Lord's leading you to go somewhere else, tell me so I can release you. Why? It's not a small thing to me that I'm responsible. I'm going to have to stand before the Lord uh, account for you. And when you just disappear, you're not doing me any favors because you're mad at me or you're embarrassed or whatever. I'm not that touchy. If you're going to leave, let me bless you and release you. And you know what I'm going to do? As I've done and you have seen me do, sow them. Multiply me, that person in this church. Not they're bitter and they're angry and they're frustrated. Because they didn't come that way. They got that way for some reason. Again, some came and they weren't sheep. All I'm simply telling you is that the environment in your sowing has everything to do with the environment of your tithe. Tithe is producing back more than just the windows of heaven. It's creating an environment, a climate. Number four, recognize your harvest. This is a big one. Most people never really notice or recognize or identify what is harvest. Many people have reaped small or little when they could have reaped a lot simply because they didn't recognize the opportunity to harvest. They missed the blessing. Consider the importance of each of these elements, starting with the crucial element of timing. Scripturally, you know that you're not going to plant today and reap tomorrow. Galatians 6, 9 says that we must wait until due season. So we have to recognize in, in the sowing and reaping there is a process of time. And if you've been sowing for years, there should be a continual harvest and planting. Harvest and planting. Harvest and planting. There's not like one season where all the harvest from all the years of giving show up. There are things harvesting in my life today, and there are things God are speaking to me about needing a harvest for that I'm sowing towards right now today as well. And notice the seed I'm using to get there is from the harvest of the seed I sowed before. So it's very small thinking when you give just to get the rent. You pay, I just need my electric bill caught up. All right, well, we all know that needs to be done, but how about I put a little more pressure on this seed to get ahead? So I'm going to find somebody to help pay their bill. When I pay my bill, I'm not going to rob God from the blessing. When the harvest comes in, he's getting his first. You know how you rob God, right? You pay all your bills first, and then what's left over, you give. No, no, no. Give first. You always have enough to tithe. So you've got to consider the importance of timing. The one and only way you could possibly tell when due season comes is by the witness of the Holy Spirit. Again, He will bring to your attention a harvest you're looking for. But when you're not even looking for it, he's like, hello. And you're like, what? <laughs> Opportunity, right timing. This is the place. Buy now, it's low. I'll tell you when to sell it high. But we don't hear it. Because we're either broke or cheap or tight or we just don't like that person. 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. So there is a timing situation, a due season to harvest. But there's also unction, the element of unction. It's important because it enables you to sense when you're getting close to a harvest. There's, there's the timing, the due season that comes, led by the Holy Spirit. And then there's an unction, a knowing it's coming. An opportunity is coming. There are, how many times have you ever given with a specific thing in mind? And you can tell when you're getting closer to it. Things around you. Have you ever sowed for a raise? And then, so you sow for increase, and then you start to see things get busier at work. You know what happens typically when you get busier, right? You get more money. People notice what you do with that busy. 
when you start getting something, think, you know, there's just an awareness, an unction. I'm not trying to spiritualize it so much as I'm saying. It's just a knowing things are happening. Things are changing. This is an opportunity I need to take. This is a door I need to go through. This is a relationship I need to keep. I have some of that in my life right now with some of these things I'm doing outside of church. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out, what are you, why am I here, God? What are you wanting me to get from this? And I, I have a knowing there's a reason, but I can't see it. I can't see far enough down to understand the value of it. Because right now, I just look at what it's costing me in time. And so, but I know there's something there. So I, I either need to follow that unction or I could just ignore it. But the problem is, am I willing to lose something God might have for me down there? Because I'm looking at what it's costing me right now. See, when I have that unction or awareness, there's a point here. I need to stay at this job. I need to, fe I need to foster this, this relationship. Rather than turn inward, I need to put some pressure on my insecurity and stir this up. Do this. Call this person. Buy that stock. Don't buy that stock. Are you hearing me? There are just so many unctions, things, things that God is trying to work in you to position you for harvest. And if you'll do that, the harvest will be greater. God has put me in places in jobs, secular jobs, that I got there. And I, I didn't get there because of my skill. I got there because I was in the right place at the right time, and I maximized that moment. And God promoted and God increased and God favored. And I could see it clearly. And I could understand clearly that God was a part of this. And I'm not an idiot. That's harvest. We want dollar for more dollars. And that's all we think about. And so many times God wants to get that dollar through your action, through your life. So you got to be aware. you got to be sensitive. You can't look past that unction of, because it requires some effort. Isaiah 9, 3, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. One key indi indi indication that your harvest is due is the element of joy. Joy will rise up in your heart, expectation, excitement. Now listen, joy is not a reason to quit staying in faith. This is something I've learned the hard way. You, you get an unction, you know you're right there. You're on the edge of seeing manifestation, and it's like we take our foot off the gas. Oh, we're here. No, you're not here until it's here. Almost here, knowing it's here, it's right there. No, no, no. Stay in faith. Stay expectant. Keep pressing in. Keep looking for places to sow. When it's in your pocket and it's in your hands, that's when you harvest. Joy is just to, to feed the unction to keep it up, to keep going. And a sense of an excitement in your heart is so important in your consistent giving. There's so much joy that comes from a an opportunity to sow into a person's life. And that joy should encourage your giving, whether that person ever does anything with it or not. What I got out of that is what I'm going to get from it. Not what they do with it. And, you know, I'm not taking credit for that. I'm giving, I'm giving, I'm giving. Why? Because I want God's harvest and blessing and increase in me. I want to be a giver. So many people just... Pucker up when they hear that word. Be a giver. Uh, we can't afford that. Well, that's the problem. You'll never get any more than that kind of attitude will allow you to give because that's where the seed's coming from. Come on. Number five is the obedience of faith. You need to know where your harvest will be. Recognize your harvest. And faith gets you to the place where it is. Practically speaking, you have to locate where the cornfield is before you can reap the corn. Knowing it's there isn't enough. i got to know where that seed I have an unction is. The Lord knows, and you got to trust Him. You know, it would be easier just to give you a bunch of, here's specific things. But that's not how this works. It's all a spiritual principle. 
And all of these things, see, you remember this, when the seed goes in the ground, what happens to it? It becomes spiritual. And now it begins to move things and change things and produce things in the spirit. And while that's in the spirit producing a harvest, I'm out here living by faith. I'm out here continuing to sow. And that seed, when it reaches harvest, being obedient, staying in faith, the Spirit will lead me, the unction will lead me to that harvest, and I'll know where it is. And it'll go from the Spirit into the natural. And when it's in my pocket, it's no longer spiritual, it's natural. Are y'all following me? So I got seed in the ground... Those people I gave into, I don't know where they are. I don't know what they're doing. You know, we give lots of money to missionaries, but I'm not in China. I don't know what he's doing. I'm not in, in Mexico. I, 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 the seed's there. I'm trusting God. But God is going to produce a harvest, and my harvest has to be here where I'm at. So it's producing in the Spirit in Mexico, but the manifestation of it's going to happen in me, through me, to me. Why? Because I stayed in faith about it. That seed is working no matter if he's inappropriate with the money. It has nothing to do with whether that seed will work. If I gave it into good ground in that moment, I, you know, I don't know what ministries do. A lot of ministries start out well. But, you know, just because they got into sin don't mean all give up. No, when I gave it, in the moment I gave it is when the ground is determined. Are you hearing me? This is important. Think about all the people who have sown into these ministries that went into, you know, foreclosure and closed down because of sin and all of those things. And all those people just, oh, I just wasted it. Did you? You did if you knew they were doing that and you kept giving to them. Yeah, you did waste it. But when you gave not knowing, only knowing what you did know, my total attitude would be this, honestly. If you're praying about it and being led by the Holy Ghost, you'll know. You'll know when it starts to turn sour. And you'll know when I need to start backing away from that thing. If you don't recognize that and it's like, what happened? Then I haven't been paying enough attention. Not, not to what they're doing, but to what I'm hearing God tell me. Because God is supposed to be watching out for me. His Spirit's guiding me. So I should know by the Holy Ghost when it's time to, to, to pivot. But when I gave in that moment, it was right, and God led me, and I knew it, and it was faith. It will continue to produce if I'll stay obedient to the faith in which I gave it. Romans 16, 26. God calls, Romans 16, 26 calls steps obedience. The steps of giving, the steps of sowing, the steps of harvest is all an act of obedience to faith. I believe. I believe what God says to do and I'm doing it. And that obedience in that moment must continue to happen throughout the journey. And a lot of the reasons why harvest is small is we stop. We stop staying in faith over it. We stop believing God for it. We stop watering it. We just move on to other issues in life. We let pressures and circumstances get us out. Let me give you an example. How many times have people tied and sowed and then waited? Their harvest time came and God said, take this step. Expand your business here. Start a new business here. And for whatever reason, they got frayed. They started doing the math in their head and said, I can't afford to do that. For whatever reason, they got afraid and they yielded to unbelief. I think all of us have been in that moment. Um, maybe it wasn't something as dramatic as a business, but maybe God said, give to that missionary. And we thought, well, you know, I don't know. God said 100 and you gave 10. You know, it's just all of us have kind of been in those seasons where we look back and think, I should have done that. And that's the example I'm making. For whatever reason, we got afraid and we didn't yield to belief. But we decided to play it safe. We didn't want to take on the extra work. We didn't want to do the extra efforts. And the result of not taking that step of obedience is what? We missed blessing. The harvest dried up. The harvest reduced. You know, it's like looking at a farmer's crop of harvest. And then hail comes. And overnight, hail destroyed half the crop. 
So yesterday he was like, woo, and today he's, <laughs> he's crying. And we often have those experiences in our own spiritual life. When we're giving, we're, we're, we're in faith, and we're doing those things, and we're right there, and God is leading us, and then we get that unction to do something. <laughs> this was enough, God. I've done enough. I've proven enough. And in doing that, what are we doing? We are reducing the size of the harvest. You'll get something. But boy, you could have got a lot more if you'd have just stayed in faith and trusted God. Boy, it doesn't sound like giving is as easy as we thought, is it? It's not just throw it in the bucket. That's where it starts. This is all the stuff you're doing between the bucket and manifestation. There's a lot of things we should be doing. This is why we shouldn't be so lackadaisical in the way we give. When we fail to recognize our harvest, our lack of faith can oftentimes cause us to miss those places of timing. Those timed places where God had you to manifest right now. Do you know a farmer has a season, right? And if he waits past the season to harvest, the harvest will begin to die and rot and he'll lose. He'll have loss. And oftentimes, that's what happens to us. We give, we sow, we're in faith, we're doing things. The right time is here, the unction is there, the joy is there. But there's work involved, there's effort involved. There's people that we have to talk to and things we have to do. And suddenly we second guess and question and doubt and drag our feet. That's a huge one. We just take too long and we go right past the perfect time. So we're still in time, but we're not in perfect time. We're at the end of time. So we get something, but we all, I could have sworn that was going to turn out better. It would have, if you'd have moved when you were supposed to. Praise God, we just want, here's 20, give me 200. I don't know how many times I've heard, I'd just be happy getting my tithe back. That's a problem. You know what that is? That is a reflection of the attitude in which you gave it. Because your whole true motive was to get something back. And I'm all for getting something back. But I'm giving it in faith. It's not legal. A legalistic attitude is, well, I gave 10%, but I've never seen 10% back. I had a conversation with a guy about that. He said, I'm a big giver, but I swear I've never seen as much as I've given come back. And I wished in the moment I'd have had time to preach this sermon to him. And I think, where is our heart when we're measuring God in that capacity? I want to measure my harvest, not God's effort. My giving is not like, all right, God, let's see what you do with it. No, my giving is, God, here it is. I know what you're going to do with it. And my faith is in what you can and what you have promised. That's it. I'm not going to test him by seeing what happens. Well, I put a thousand in once and nothing happens, so I'm not sure I'm doing that again. Keep it, by the way. Don't, don't do that. We don't test God in that way. Tithe says, prove me now herewith. The test is in obedience to do. When it comes to seed, offering, the other 90, we're not testing God with that. That is your opportunity to produce what kind of harvest you want. And when we're not sowing as often as we should, when we're not looking at the places we're sowing it, when we're not tithing regularly as we should, when we're not recognizing the opportunity for harvest, and when we're not staying in faith about it, it will not produce at the measure we wanted it to when we gave it. You have to implement action to your faith. But the right action, the spirit-led action, the action that will produce harvest. You know, there have been times where I have sown in an offering. I sowed <clears throat> to a building fund when we were young and first married. I sowed into the church's building fund because I wanted to get my house paid off. And in my mind, I thought God's going to supernaturally pay it off. I mean, it wasn't very much. The whole house was like 60 grand. Cars cost more than that now. But in that day, it might as well have been $6 million. My payment was 500 bucks, and I had to split it up between paychecks to make it. Y'all remember those days? And when I sowed, 
I mean, I was in faith. <clears throat> and in that moment, I realized right there, God is my source. And you know what happened? He didn't supernaturally pay it off in some way my mind envisioned. But what he did do is he caused it to, call, to, to increase in value to the point where when I did sell it, not only did it pay it off, I was able to take money out of it and give to the person to help buy it. And I still had enough from that house. It doubled the amount of money that I made. So I bought it for 60, sold it for 120. I owed like 30 grand on it or whatever. So when all said and done, I doubled my money. In my mind, I wanted it paid off. God said, no, no, I'll, I'll pay it off, but I'll do more than pay it off. I'll let you have seed to give to someone else to get in it to be a blessing, but I'll give you more than enough. And that money, follow the path, that money helped me buy my next house. And my next house I used to help me when we were building this church. And we came to a place where we were $30,000 short of finishing. And I took it out of that house that I got from that house that I sowed for that house. And God used that money to put into this and got this house. And then when I sold that house, I did the same thing. God blessed me the same way, and I helped the next family. It was more money I helped with, but God helped me help them, and I was able to take that money, and it just continues. I'm doing the same thing right now, closing on another house this week. And God has multiplied the money I'm taking out of that house to do something greater he wants me to do, and I'm doing it. And I'm getting choked up because it excites me that God is so faithful. And you know what? I could have just got in this little pea brain mindset of no mortgage. It had nothing to do with the stupid mortgage. It had to do with faith. It had to do with obedience. It had to do with being a sower and not getting cheap and tight. Because that's all I've ever known is cheap and tight. It's trusting God to do something greater with my life than just be attached to a stupid dollar. God will give you that stuff. Are you following me today? Faith is so essential. Last scripture, and I'll end here. James 2, 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith and does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, depart in peace and be warmed and filled, Jesus loves you. We'll be praying for you. That's the same thing. He says, but don't give them things that are needed for the body natural. What is it profit? Your prayers aren't going to feed him or clothe him. That's what he's saying. Thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. Someone says you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by works. Are you hearing me? I'm talking about timing, unction, sensitivity, awareness of seed, trusting that God will multiply and increasing it, keeping a continual heart of giving, 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 a willingness, a desire to do that, not limiting God when it's perfect timing. I'll do the work. The devil will not rob me. I've been working on my house sales since December. God told me in October. And things have happened, and I thought, yeah, it's going to work. And then it didn't. And yes, yeah, so we're going to close. And then we did it. And, and you know what? It's an obedience of faith. Stay in faith. Stay in faith. Don't get angry. Don't give up. Don't lose joy. Don't lose focus on what you're doing. Are you hearing me? I mean, we just throw it in a bucket and think, okay, it's done. No, it's so much more. Live your life expectant. Live your life putting pressure in obedience. I am a sower, God. I am a sower. I'm not an eater. I will always eat because I'm a sower. You will always starve when you're only an eater. Somewhere you got to change your approach to the problems in your life. I'm sowing my way out of these things. I'm sowing my way into blessing. I'm sowing my way into an attitude of obedience. I'm staying in faith. I'm working by faith. I'm doing the things. And when God creates the environment, when I know what to do, I'm going to do it with such zeal and joy and excitement. And bless God, if it means less TV, it means less TV time.
If it means get out of bed earlier, I'm getting out of bed earlier. Because I want all the harvest that God has for me. So I can sow more. Not so I can go on vacation. Not so I can just feel better without pressure. If you don't like pressure, you will not like living by faith. I don't know if you heard what I'm saying, but there is no such thing as faith without pressure. You will always, those things will always work in unison because you have an adversary and he steals, kills, and destroys. And he will come against you in every way and fashion to stop you. You're not stopping me. You can be 10 days, it can be 10 days later than I thought, but I'm not quitting. There's an attitude involved in these things. And when we don't even have one, we limit the, fa- the, 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 the effectiveness of the seed that we have in the ground. Jen, why don't you come on up? Let me finish by, we didn't get to point six, but the first five were pretty good, all right? So you got plenty out of that. Let me close by challenging you this. If you're tired of small reaping, determine to set your sights for bigger. How do I do that? Well... By acting on the insights of God's word that we've looked at tonight. Sow more seed. Sow it into good ground. Recognize the environment, the climate in which your giving works is tied to your tithe. Don't be hit and miss with your tithe. Don't be hit and miss with your faithfulness to be a giver. Recognize the climate that the seed is living in is coming from the tithe. When you get close to seeing your harvest, you'll know by joy, you'll know by excitement, you'll know by the unction and leading of the Holy Spirit. And when he gives you insight and he directs you toward that harvest, stay in obedience, stay in faith, keep doing the work. It's right there. You see it on the, har- on, on the stalk. It's right there. Just keep going. Keep expecting. Keep pressing. Don't surrender because, oh, it's here. I don't know. I'm not a farmer, but, it, but I would believe that harvest is just as hard as planting. So the end is just as hard as the beginning. We want to think the hard part was sowing. Oh, no. The hard part's all of it. And it's only hard because I'm making it hard. Because I'm, I'm resenting the process. Because I don't like the effort. Because I'm, I, I love money more than I love God. There, there's all kinds of reasons, but we should know why we are this way. Why is this so hard? I'm not valuing what it is I'm doing when it's that hard to do. That's what it really comes down to at the end of the day. So what I want to do is let the ushers get in the aisles tonight. And I want each of us to make a decision in our own heart. Am I going to keep reaping? Am I going to keep sowing? I'm going to keep reaping and I'm going to keep sowing. I'm going to keep reaping and I'm going to keep sowing. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not surrendering. Wherever I have been concerning my giving, I'm tweaking that adjustment right now. My attitude about it is changing right now. Please listen to me while you do that. Don't let anybody talk you out of the value of sowing and reaping. There is a whole world that thinks that it is nothing but manipulation. And they love to, oh, you're just robbing from you. No, no, no. Don't let anybody talk you out of what God's word says. I've given you his word tonight. It's up to you tonight to do what you want. Remember 2 Corinthians 9, 7 in the Amplified. Be a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver. That's the motivation we need. I'm prompted to do it, and I want to do it. Amen? I have such high expectation in what God's Word says about my giving. And I'm going to be more conscious and aware of my harvest and what I'm expecting to receive from that. And I'm going to be more sensitive to the Holy Ghost, more led by the Spirit of God. Maybe we'll get into talking about that next month on Wednesday nights being led by the Holy Ghost because it is so vital to everything that is tied to the Word of God we want the Word of God to just be as easy as it is to write in an envelope and put in a bucket but really 
it starts there and then all the other things there's so much spirit to it and obedience and effort and the way we're living all of these things are connected that we need to be sensitive constantly through the process of our journey called life and when I do this and I don't do that it's for a purpose when I plant there and don't plant there it's because of I'm being led not by feelings or by emotions but by the spirit when your body is sick and it's telling you to give up and to just surrender to, to the disease and the Word of God says no the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all unrighteousness what am I going to do it's there the leading of the Spirit in that moment where my body says quit and my spirit says rejoice so many aspects of our life fall into the leading of the Holy Ghost I'd rather have a lig like the Old Testament where he's had the law and I could just go read something of the do's and don'ts but God wants a more intimate personal relationship with you and what we're doing right now is as personal and intimate and worship as you can get and maybe there's not heavenly music and angels dancing but they are in the spirit when they look at a man of God and a woman of God who says I know your word I believe your word and I'm doing your word the angels rejoice in those environments we're not grieving our angels today because we're obedient amen we're faithful and God is just looking for men and women they're very far and few between in our modern time you ready to give father in the name of Jesus thank you thank you thank you thank you for this opportunity we do it willingly we do it joyfully we do it expectantly we give to you tonight with harvest in our mind and we give generously tonight with a generous expectation of increase and harvest on our mind and we know that you are faithful as we tithe we set the climate for blessing in our homes and in our marriages and in our families and in our businesses and we lay claim to that blessing for you are multiplying and increasing us on every wave 30 60 hundred fold windows of heaven opened up pouring out upon our lives and we are led by your spirit and follow your unctions and direction and your timing and we are sensitive to the joy that is stirring in our spirit and we receive and walk in obedience and faith tonight as we give in Jesus mighty name amen ushers go ahead be in the aisles this evening Jesus made wine from water when they obeyed his command this was the beginning of miracles from things that they held in their hands it's in your hands you God praise God have some expectation this week amen let's stand tonight thank you for being out here tonight praise God God has got great things in store for us amen praise God I don't know what the announcements are does it matter do we have any we got stuff going on figured out hallelujah
Amen. Look Praise at your Lord. bulletins, right? Yes, exactly. They don't always get them on Wednesday nights. Hallelujah. This Sunday is mission trip prayer and skip practice at 5 p.m. It is also Sunday night prayer at 6 p.m. We Everyone is always invited, yes. and we have child care for the prayer meeting. And then Tuesday is the ladies' prayer meeting and devotion time, and Miss Laura is going to be speaking and ministering, so I encourage you to come to that. Amen. And, of course, we've got lots coming up in early May. There's sign-ups out there. On Mother's Day, we're going to do a baby and child dedication. If you want to be a part of that, please, please sign up. We're so excited to do that. Mm -hmm. And we've got graduations coming up in May. The men's breakfast and yes. your work day. Work day, yes. That's You're going to have a work day that's his holiday. Uh, after men's breakfast, so make sure and come to that. <laughs> Tony day. asked me if you fish, and I said, no, he works. Yes. That's his hobby. Yes. Praise so God. Good. We all done? Yeah, go ahead. All right. <laughs> Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we send him out, travel mercies, angels watch over, protect him, bring him back safely. Thank you, your word sown tonight is planted deep in our heart and this week father bring greater and more revelation and understanding to what we've heard and thank you for the harvest that is ours in jesus mighty name amen we're dismissed thank you guys we love you hey thanks for watching make sure you click like and subscribe to this channel so you can catch all our videos and live streams hey why don't you share one of these videos with your friends and remember you can catch me live every sunday morning and wednesday evening thanks for watching this is our finest hour to set men free. His command. This was the beginning.